Welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Or I will come for you. I'd like to thank Sweep the Leg and Petra Anderson for joining the Curator's Disciples. Your viewership is very much appreciated. If anyone would like early access to my latest stories and an ad-free listening experience, consider becoming one of the Curator's Disciples. The link is in the description below. Story number one. I bought my sister a new heart on the dark web by the Curator. Emily and I have always been close, inseparable, really. Growing up, we were like two peas in a pod. Our parents divorced when we were young and we moved in with our grandmother. She was a strong woman, full of love and wisdom, and she did her best to give us a stable and happy childhood. Emily was always the adventurous one, the dreamer. She wanted to be a doctor, to save lives and make a difference in the world. I was more practical, always making sure we stayed out of trouble and got our homework done. We went to the same high school, where Emily excelled in sciences and I focused on arts. I remember the countless nights we spent together, her books spread out on the table studying for her exams while I worked on my paintings. We were each other's biggest cheerleaders. When she got accepted into medical school, it was one of the proudest moments of my life. I knew she was going to do great things. Then, three years ago, everything changed. Emily started feeling tired all the time, short of breath, and she fainted a couple of times. At first, we thought it was just the stress of medical school, but the doctors confirmed our worst fears. She had end-stage heart failure. It was like a punch to the gut. My vibrant, energetic sister was suddenly confined to a hospital bed, her dreams of becoming a doctor slipping away. For three years, we waited. Emily was put on the donor list, and we hoped every day for a miracle. But as time went on, her condition worsened. She was put on ECMO, a machine that kept her alive, but just barely. I watched as the light faded from her eyes, and I felt so helpless. She was dying, and there was nothing I could do. That's when I started to lose hope in the traditional medical system. I spent countless hours researching alternative treatments, experimental drugs, anything that might help. But nothing was promising. I was desperate, and desperation makes you consider things you never thought you would. One night, after a particularly hard day at the hospital, I found myself unable to sleep. I sat at my computer, mindlessly scrolling through medical forums and health blogs, looking for anything, any glimmer of hope. I came across a post mentioning the dark web. It was a place where people did all sorts of illegal things, and it terrified me. But I was out of options. Emily's life hung in the balance, and I was willing to do anything to save her. I spent the next several days figuring out how to access the dark web. I learned about Tor, a special browser that could take me into this hidden part of the internet. It felt like diving into an abyss, a world shrouded in secrecy and danger. I was scared, but I pressed on, driven by my love for my sister. Navigating the dark web was confusing and disorienting at first. I encountered forums filled with hackers, illegal drug markets, and worse. But I kept searching, using keywords like organ donation, heart transplant, and urgent medical needs. I felt like I was running out of time. Every second wasted was a second closer to losing Emily forever. After hours of sifting through scam sites and dead ends, I found a forum where someone mentioned a site called Heartmatch. It sounded almost legitimate, like a beacon of hope in the murky waters of the dark web. The site promised a compatible heart within a week. It seemed too good to be true, but I was desperate. They claimed to guarantee a heart match, but the cost was $60,000. I didn't have that kind of money, but I couldn't let that stop me. 
I called my bank the next morning, hands shaking as I explained that I needed to remortgage my house. The loan officer asked why, and I spun a story about needing the money for urgent medical expenses. It wasn't a complete lie, but I left out the part about the dark web and the sketchy heart transplant. Signing the paperwork for the loan was one of the hardest things I've ever done. It felt like I was selling my soul, gambling my future on a desperate chance to save my sister. But I knew I had to do it. Emily was worth any price. I transferred the money, my life savings, in exchange for a promise that felt like a gamble with fate. Entering her bloodwork information onto the site was simple enough. My hands trembled as I typed in the details, double-checking everything before hitting submit. The payment process was even more nerve-wracking. After making the hefty payment, I received a confirmation email. The instructions were clear, wait seven days, and a freezer box would be delivered to our door. The next seven days felt like an eternity. Every minute that passed, I was consumed by doubt and fear. What if it was a scam? What if they couldn't find a match? What if? I didn't want to think about the what ifs. Emily's life hung in the balance. The days dragged on painfully slowly after I sent the payment. I felt a constant pit in my stomach, a mix of anxiety and guilt. Every time my phone buzzed, I jumped, hoping it was an update about the heart but it was always just spam or messages from concerned friends. I couldn't bring myself to tell anyone what I had done. They wouldn't understand. How could they? They weren't watching their sister fade away in front of them. I spent those days by Emily's side as much as I could. The hospital room had become a second home, filled with the hum of machines and the sterile smell of antiseptic. Emily tried to stay positive, but I could see the fear in her eyes. She knew her time was running out. I held her hand, told her stories from our childhood, and tried to keep her spirits up. But inside, I was a wreck. On the fifth day, I started to panic. What if the heart didn't come? What if this was all just a cruel joke? I reached out to the contact email provided, but received no response. I even tried to track the transaction, but it was as if the money had vanished into thin air. I barely slept, plagued by nightmares of Emily dying and me being powerless to stop it. In the quiet of the nights, I found myself thinking about the dark web, wondering what kind of people were behind this site. Were they doctors? Criminals? I couldn't shake the image of someone harvesting organs from innocent victims. I knew it was wrong, but I tried to push those thoughts away. I had to focus on Emily. She was my priority. On the seventh day, I woke up with a sense of dread. It felt like any other day, but I knew it was crucial. Around noon, I heard a vehicle pull up outside. My heart raced as I peeked through the window and saw a plain white van. Two men in dark clothing emerged carrying a large, heavy-looking freezer box. They moved with a brisk efficiency, clearly not wanting to attract any attention. I opened the door before they could knock, and they thrust a clipboard at me without a word. I quickly signed, my hands shaking. The men set the box down just inside the door and left as quickly as they had come. I stood there for a moment, staring at the box, feeling a mix of relief and horror. The box was about the size of a small refrigerator, white with metallic trim. There was a transparent window on the top, and through it, I could see the heart. It looked fresh, its deep red color a stark contrast against the sterile white packaging. I knelt down and placed my hand on the box. It was cold to the touch, the chill seeping through my fingers. I called Emily's doctor immediately. He was hesitant but I convinced him to perform the surgery. Emily's condition was dire. We couldn't afford to wait. The next few hours were a blur of medical preparations and anxious waiting. I watched 
as the medical team wheeled Emily into the operating room. My heart was pounding, and I felt like I could barely breathe. I knew this was her last chance, and I prayed that everything would go smoothly. The doctor assured me that they would take every precaution, but I could see the worry in his eyes too. The waiting room was empty, save for a few other families lost in their own worlds of anxiety. I tried to distract myself with old magazines and my phone, but nothing could take my mind off what was happening behind those doors. Each second felt like an hour as I sat there. I couldn't help but think about the journey that had brought us to this moment. I remembered the nights I spent on the dark web, navigating through the shadows of the internet. I thought about the forum post that had led me to Heartmatch, the detailed steps on how to access their site, and the cold clinical emails I had exchanged with their representatives. The site's interface was surprisingly professional. It had a login portal, a list of services, and even a live chat option for immediate inquiries. I had initially been suspicious, but the desperation in me had drowned out my doubts. The process was straightforward. Enter the patient's bloodwork details, provide a delivery address, and make the payment. The price tag was steep, $60,000, but what choice did I have? I remembered the fear that gripped me as I remortgaged my house. The loan officer's skeptical look, the paperwork that seemed to stretch on forever, and the gnawing guilt in my stomach. I felt like I was making a deal with the devil, selling my soul for a sliver of hope. As the surgery continued, I wandered outside the hospital to clear my head. The world outside seemed indifferent to my plight. People went about their lives, unaware of the life or death struggle happening within the hospital walls. I felt like screaming, telling everyone about the sacrifice I had made, the lengths I'd gone to for my sister. But I kept it inside. This was my burden to bear. Hours passed, and the waiting became unbearable. I returned to the hospital, my nerves frayed. Finally, the doctor emerged, looking exhausted but with a smile on his face. The surgery was a success, the doctor said his expression a blend of exhaustion and relief. Emily's going to need a lot of rest and monitoring, but she's stable. Relief washed over me, and tears began to stream down my face. Emily was alive. The heart had worked. For the first time in a long while, I felt a glimmer of hope. The following days were a whirlwind. Emily was weak, but improving her color gradually returning, her breathing becoming more even. I stayed by her side, helping her with everything from eating to walking a few tentative steps. The doctors were cautiously optimistic, constantly monitoring her vital signs and running tests to ensure her body was accepting the new heart. Despite the joy of seeing Emily recover, a dark cloud loomed over me, the memory of the freezer box the nature of its arrival, and the secretive process I had gone through to obtain it gnawed at my conscience. I couldn't shake the feeling that this miracle came with a terrible price. Three days after the surgery, a small unmarked package arrived at our doorstep. It was a plain cardboard box, about the size of a shoebox, with no return address or any identifying marks. I felt a chill run down my spine as I picked it up. The box was light, but the weight of what it might contain pressed heavily on my mind. I brought the box inside and set it on the kitchen table. My hands trembled as I opened it, revealing a card and a small USB drive. The card was simple, with elegant but cold lettering that read, Thank you for your business. The message was so impersonal, so detached, that it sent a shiver through me. I picked up the USB drive, my mind racing with possibilities. I knew I had to see what was on it, but I was also terrified of what I might find. I took the drive to my laptop, plugged it in, and opened the single video file it contained. My heart pounded as I clicked play, and what I saw made my blood run cold. The video was grainy, 
but clear enough to make out the horrific details. It showed a dimly lit, makeshift operating room. The camera was positioned in a corner, capturing a wide view of the room. There were several men, all wearing surgical masks and gloves, moving around a central figure on an operating table. The man on the table was restrained, his limbs tied down with thick straps. He was clearly drugged, but semi-conscious, his eyes darting around in panic, his movements sluggish. I recognized the setting immediately. It was a back alley surgery, far removed from any legitimate medical facility. The men worked with grim efficiency, drawing blood and running tests with portable equipment. They spoke in hushed tones, their faces obscured by masks. The scene was surreal, like something out of a nightmare. I watched in horror as they confirmed the man's blood type and compatibility. What followed was even worse. One of the men picked up a scalpel and made the first incision. The camera zoomed in, focusing on the man's chest as they began to cut. The sight of the blood, the sound of the flesh being sliced open, was nauseating. The man on the table writhed and moaned, the drugs dulling his senses, but not completely numbing him to the pain. The video was a gruesome documentation of the entire procedure. They worked methodically, removing the heart with precise movements. The scene felt endless, every second stretching into eternity. I was frozen, unable to look away, my mind screaming in silent horror. Finally, they placed the harvested heart into a sterile container, the same one that had arrived at my door. The men cleaned up quickly, disposing of the man's body with a chilling lack of emotion. The video ended abruptly, leaving me staring at the screen, my mind reeling from what I had just witnessed. I felt sick to my stomach. I rushed to the bathroom and vomited, my body convulsing with the force of my disgust and horror. When I finally composed myself, I sat on the cold bathroom floor, trying to process what I had seen. This was the price of Emily's new heart. An innocent man had been murdered, his life brutally taken to save my sister. I had paid for it, facilitated it, and now I had to live with the knowledge of what I had done. I knew I could never tell Emily. She was starting to regain her strength, her spirits lifting as she began to hope for a future. I couldn't destroy that hope with the truth, but the images from the video haunted me. The man's terrified eyes and his silent screams etched into my memory. Every time I looked at Emily, I saw his face. I saw the blood, the surgical masks, the cold, clinical detachment of the men who had harvested his heart. I had saved my sister, but at an unimaginable cost. The weight of that knowledge pressed down on me, a constant reminder of the darkness I had embraced to save her. Emily's recovery continued, and the doctors were amazed at her progress. She started to walk again, her strength returning little by little. I smiled and celebrated with her, but inside I was crumbling. The guilt and horror of what I had done were tearing me apart. The video was a secret I would carry with me forever. It was a burden I couldn't share, a dark stain on my soul. I had saved Emily, but in doing so, I had lost a part of myself. The price of her life was a sacrifice I would never forget. Story number two. I gave my husband dark web experimental drugs by the curator. Hi everyone, I need to get this off my chest. I've never posted anything like this before, but I don't know where else to turn. I need to tell someone, anyone, what happened. Maybe it will help me process it, or at least make me feel less alone. Here goes. So, I'm married. I'm not going to say my name or his name because honestly, I don't want anyone to know who we are. We live in the US, and from the outside, everything probably looks pretty normal. But, it's not. 
It hasn't been for a long time. My husband used to be this amazing guy. He was charming, handsome, and made me feel like the most special person in the world. We met in college during our junior year. He was the star of the football team, and I was a quiet literature major. Our paths crossed at a mutual friend's party, and it was like something out of a fairy tale. He was so attentive, so kind. He made me feel like I was the only person in the room. We started dating, and everything was perfect. He would surprise me with little notes, flowers, and spontaneous trips to our favorite spots. We talked about our future, our dreams, and everything in between. After graduation, we moved in together and got married within a year. It was a small, beautiful ceremony with just close family and friends. I thought I was living my dream. But after the wedding, things started to change. At first, it was little things. He'd come home later and later from work, always with some excuse about meetings or traffic. He stopped being as attentive, and the little gestures that made me fall in love with him disappeared. I tried to talk to him about it, but he brushed me off, saying he was just stressed with work. Then, I started noticing the smell of perfume that wasn't mine on his clothes, lipstick stains on his collar, and strange charges on our credit card bills. When I confronted him, he didn't even bother denying it. He just shrugged and told me I was being paranoid. I tried to hold on, hoping things would go back to the way they were, but they didn't. Instead, they got worse. He became more arrogant, acting like he was above everyone else, especially me. He'd openly flirt with other women in front of me, sometimes even bringing them home when he knew I'd be there. The pain and humiliation were unbearable, but I didn't know what to do. I felt trapped, like I had no way out. Then, he started using drugs. At first, it was just recreational stuff, things he'd do at parties. But soon, it became a regular thing. He'd come home high, sometimes not coming home at all. He'd spend all night out, partying, doing God knows what with God knows who. He didn't care about me or our marriage anymore. I was just a convenient maid, someone to cook his meals and clean up after him. I fell into a deep depression, isolated myself from friends and family, too ashamed to tell them what was going on. I felt so alone and so angry. I wanted to hurt him the way he hurt me. I wanted him to suffer. I know it sounds terrible, but I reached my breaking point. I couldn't take it anymore. I decided if he loved his drugs so much, I'd ruin them for him. I wanted him to have a trip so bad that he'd never touch them again. I started researching online, trying to find something that would give him the worst trip of his life. I began with regular search engines, looking for stories about bad trips and dangerous drug experiences. I read countless forums and articles, but nothing seemed extreme enough. I needed something guaranteed to be horrific. One sleepless night, I stumbled upon a thread in an obscure forum that talked about the dark web. It was filled with horror stories about illegal activities, but one post caught my eye. It mentioned a site selling experimental drugs with unpredictable and often terrifying side effects. The post was vague and filled with warnings, but it intrigued me. I spent the next few days learning how to access the dark web. It was like diving into a murky, forbidden ocean. I downloaded a special browser, installed various security measures, and finally I was in. It was a maze of hidden sites and anonymous interactions, but I was determined. After hours of searching, I found the website mentioned in the forum. It looked like any other drug site, but with a sinister twist. They advertised their products with chilling descriptions, promising mind-blowing experiences and life-changing trips. 
the side effects were always listed as varied and unpredictable, but that was exactly what I wanted. I hesitated, my finger hovering over the mouse. Was I really going to do this? The answer was yes. I was past caring about the consequences. I place an order for a batch of their strongest experimental drug, using cryptocurrency to keep the transaction untraceable. Then I waited. It felt like forever, but finally the package arrived. Saturday night came. My husband was getting ready to go out and party, like always. He was in the bedroom, rifling through his drawer for his favorite shirt, the one I hated because it reminded me of all the nights he'd worn it to impress someone else. I could barely look at him without feeling a mix of rage and sadness. I knew what I was about to do was risky, but I was past caring. I just wanted him to suffer. I had the drugs in my pocket, hidden in a small, nondescript vial. My heart was pounding as I made my way to the bathroom where he kept his stash. He never locked the door, too arrogant to think I'd ever mess with his precious supply. I opened the cabinet and found his usual stash of pills and powders. Carefully, I swapped them out with the experimental drugs. My hands were shaking, but I managed to do it without making a mess. I walked back into the bedroom, trying to act normal. He didn't even glance at me as he swallowed the pills with a gulp of water. I felt a sick satisfaction watching him. He deserved this for everything he'd put me through. He finished getting ready, fixing his hair in the mirror and checking his phone for messages. I could see the excitement in his eyes, the anticipation of another night of partying and hooking up with strangers. It made my blood boil, but I kept my cool. I needed to see this through. As he was about to leave, I decided to follow him. I told him I needed to go out for some air, and he just shrugged, not caring one way or the other. We walked out together, but he was too high to notice me tailing him. I kept my distance, watching as he stumbled down the street, the effects of the drug starting to kick in. He headed to his usual spot, a dingy club known for its wild parties and easy access to drugs. I waited outside, peeking through the grimy windows. Inside, the music was loud, the lights flashing in a dizzying array of colors. He was already starting to act strange, more paranoid than usual. He kept looking around the room like he was seeing things that weren't there. He deserved this. I hoped he was seeing all his worst fears come to life. He moved through the crowd, his movements jerky and erratic. People started to notice, giving him strange looks, but no one intervened. They were all too busy with their own highs to care. He made his way to the bar, knocking over a few glasses as he tried to steady himself. The bartender looked annoyed, but served him another drink. He took a sip, but then spit it out, his eyes wide with terror. He started shouting, something about the drink being poisoned. People were backing away from him now, whispering and pointing. I watched from the shadows, my heart racing. This was it. This was what I wanted. He was spiraling, and there was no stopping it. He staggered away from the bar, clutching his head and muttering to himself. I could see the fear in his eyes, the realization that something was very, very wrong. He made a beeline for the exit, pushing people out of the way in his desperation. I followed him out, keeping my distance. He was running now, his movements frantic and uncoordinated. He kept looking over his shoulder as if something was chasing him. He reached our apartment building, fumbling with his keys and cursing under his breath. I slipped in behind him before the door closed, following him up the stairs. He was panting, sweating, his eyes wild with fear. He reached our apartment and threw open the door, slamming it behind him. I waited a moment, then quietly opened the door and slipped inside. I could hear him in the bathroom, the sound of things breaking, glass shattering, and then this awful, guttural screaming. My heart was in my throat as I rushed to the bathroom. What I saw 
will haunt me forever. There was blood everywhere. The white tiles were slick with it, the crimson liquid pooling and spreading in a nightmarish pattern. He was standing in front of the broken mirror, shards of glass scattered around his feet, his reflection distorted and fragmented. He had started mutilating himself. His face was a horror show of torn flesh and exposed muscle. He was screaming, they can't kill me if I can't see them. Over and over, the words slurred and gobbled through the blood and spit. His eyes, oh God, his eyes. He had gouged his own eyes out with the blunt end of a toothbrush, which now lay discarded in the sink, coated in blood and bits of flesh. His eye sockets were empty, gaping holes, blood pouring down his cheeks like tears. He reached up with trembling hands, grabbing a shard of glass from the sink. I watched in frozen terror as he brought the glass to his face and started peeling the skin away as if trying to remove a mask. The sound of tearing flesh and his guttural screams filled the small bathroom, creating a symphony of horror that I will never forget. He was in a frenzy, his movements erratic and desperate. Blood sprayed the walls as he slashed at his face, his chest heaving with ragged breaths. He kept muttering incoherently, his words interspersed with cries of pain and terror. His hands were slick with blood, making it harder for him to grip the glass, but he persisted, driven by some inner torment that I couldn't comprehend. I wanted to move, to stop him, but my legs felt like they were made of lead. I could only watch in helpless horror as he continued to mutilate himself, his body convulsing with each new cut. His screams were starting to weaken, his energy draining away with the copious amounts of blood he was losing. Finally, he collapsed to the floor, the shard of glass slipping from his fingers and skittering across the tiles. He lay there, twitching, his breath coming in shallow, labored gasps. The bathroom was a scene from a nightmare, the walls and floor coated in blood, the air thick with the metallic scent of it. I snapped out of my paralysis and grabbed my phone, dialing 911 with trembling hands. I could barely speak, my voice shaking as I tried to explain what had happened. The operator kept asking questions, but all I could do was scream for them to send help. The ambulance arrived quickly, but it felt like an eternity. The paramedics rushed in, their faces grim as they took in the scene. They worked quickly, trying to stabilize him but I could see it in their eyes. They didn't think he was going to make it. The police arrived shortly after, their questions a blur as I tried to explain what had happened. They wanted to know about the drugs, where they came from, why he had taken them. I told them the truth, or at least as much of it as I could without implicating myself. They seemed more interested in closing the case quickly than in finding out the real story. They wrote it off as a drug-fueled self-mutilation, another tragedy in a city full of them. They didn't care about the details, about the horror I had witnessed. They just wanted to move on, to get back to their routine. As they wheeled him out on a stretcher, his face a ruined mess of blood and flesh, I felt a strange mix of emotions. Relief that it was over. Guilt for what I had done and a sick satisfaction that he had finally suffered as much as I had. The days following that horrific night felt like a surreal blur. I was numb, moving through life on autopilot. The apartment was eerily silent, the walls bearing the stains of the chaos that had erupted within them. The blood had been cleaned, but the memories were seared into my mind, an indelible mark of my guilt and anger. I spent the first few days in a daze, barely eating or sleeping. The police had come and gone, their questions a relentless barrage that I had answered mechanically. I had told them about the drugs, but I had kept my part in it hidden. They had been quick to label it a drug-fueled accident, their curiosity sated by the simple explanation. 
It seemed they were more eager to close the case than to delve into the complexities of our broken lives. When the initial shock began to wear off, I was left with a hollow emptiness. The silence of the apartment was suffocating. I couldn't bear to be there, surrounded by the remnants of our life together. I started spending my days outside, wandering the streets aimlessly, trying to escape the images that haunted me. I couldn't escape the guilt. It gnawed at me, a constant reminder of what I had done. I had wanted him to suffer, but I hadn't anticipated the depth of his self-destruction. His screams, his bloodied face, the madness in his eyes, it was all my doing. The satisfaction I had felt in the moment had turned to ashes in my mouth. The hospital called me a few days later. They needed me to come in and discuss his condition. I dreaded the visit, but I knew I had to go. I owed him that much, at least. When I arrived, the sterile smell of the hospital hit me like a wave, bringing back memories of my mother's last days. The fluorescent lights buzzed overhead, casting a harsh light on everything. A nurse led me to his room, her face a mask of professional detachment. She opened the door, and I stepped inside, my heart pounding. He was lying in the bed, his face swathed in bandages, his eyes covered. The machines beeped softly, a monotonous reminder of his fragile hold on life. He looked so small and vulnerable, a far cry from the arrogant man who had once dominated my life. I stood there, unable to move, my emotions a tangled mess. Part of me felt pity for him, but another part of me felt a grim satisfaction. This was the price of his betrayal. The doctor entered the room, breaking the silence. He explained that they had managed to save his life, but his injuries were severe. He had lost his eyes, the damage too extensive to repair. His face was a patchwork of stitches and skin grafts. He would never look the same again. As the doctor spoke, I felt a wave of nausea. I had done this. I had pushed him to the edge, and he had fallen. The enormity of it all crashed over me, leaving me breathless. I listened to the doctor's words, but my mind was elsewhere, replaying that night over and over. They left me alone with him after a while, giving me time to process everything. I sat down in the chair next to his bed, my hands trembling. I wanted to say something, anything, but the words wouldn't come. He was still sedated, his breathing shallow and even. I reached out, hesitating for a moment before taking his hand. It was cold, unresponsive. I sat there for what felt like hours, lost in my thoughts. The memories of our life together, both good and bad, played through my mind. I remembered the early days, when we were happy and in love, and the slow unraveling of our relationship. I had loved him once, deeply. But that love had turned to bitterness, and now, here we were, broken and scarred. As I sat there, I realized that I needed help. I couldn't carry this burden alone. I needed to talk to someone, to make sense of the chaos in my mind. The hospital had a counselor, and I decided to see her. It was the first step towards healing, a small glimmer of hope in the darkness. The sessions with the counselor were hard at first. I had to confront the anger and pain that had driven me to such extremes. I had to face the fact that I had let my hatred consume me, and in doing so, I had destroyed not just my husband's life, but my own as well. The counselor helped me to see that, while my actions were unforgivable, I could find a way to move forward. It would take time and it would be painful, but it was possible. I visited him regularly, watching as he slowly recovered. Each visit was a test of my resolve, a reminder of what I had done. He was different now, quieter, subdued. The arrogance that had once defined him was gone, replaced by a fragile vulnerability. He would never be the same, and neither would I. 
As the weeks passed, I began to see a glimmer of hope. The counselor helped me to find ways to cope with my guilt and anger. I started to rebuild my life piece by piece. It wasn't easy, and there were days when the darkness threatened to overwhelm me. But I kept going, driven by a desire to find some semblance of peace. One day, as I sat by his bedside, he woke up. His voice was weak, barely a whisper, but it was him. He asked me what had happened, and I told him as much as I could without revealing my part in it. He listened, his expression unreadable. When I finished, he was silent for a long time, and then he simply nodded, accepting the new reality of his life. In that moment, I realized that forgiveness was a long way off, both from him and from myself. But there was a chance, however slim, that we could find a way to move forward. We were both broken, but perhaps we could help each other heal. I continued to visit him, and slowly, we started to rebuild our relationship. It was tentative, fragile, built on a foundation of shared pain and regret. We had both changed, and it would take time to find our way back to something resembling normalcy. In the end, I realized that revenge had not brought me the satisfaction I hoped for. It had only deepened my wounds, creating new scars that would take a lifetime to heal. But there was a chance for redemption, a chance to make things right, and that was worth fighting for. This is The Curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time.